On September 2nd, 1945, the United States and Japan signed the official treaty ending World War II. It was a war that would leave a lasting impact on the whole country, both positively and negatively. On the 75th anniversary, we thought we'd look back at the role our state played in the war with historian Felix Bunnell. World War II really changed Washington, changed Seattle and King County more than pretty much any other event in the 20th century. Thousands of people moved here for wartime jobs. Because we we're on the Pacific Coast, there was the fear that right away, right after Pearl Harbor in, in December of 41, there was fear that we would be attacked. And so there were, there were air raid drills, there were blackouts. In fact, even before Pearl Harbor, Seattle was famous because we were the first big city in the country to practice an air raid drill. All the lights went off. There were these famous photographs in Life magazine. But pretty much overnight, the city was on a war footing as of December 1941. It meant things were rationed like sugar and gasoline. I mean, there were, there were happy things, too. There were war bond rallies in a place called Victory Square, which was this temporary monument that was set up down at 4th, Ave 4th Avenue and University, kind of where the Fairmont Hotel is now. There was a big pylon, like a big tall monolith that they, where they put the names of war casualties. But famous Hollywood celebrities, famous soldiers and sailors, airmen, Marines would come through town, give these lunchtime presentations on weekdays and weekends, and people would sort of rally around. Uh, the war was really a huge economic boost after 10 years of the Great Depression. It was pretty much full employment. Shipyards were building ships, of course. Boeing was famously building the B-17 bomber, which helped win the war in Europe. And a big factory along the Duwamish River that very famously didn't just have a regular roof. They put a little fake town on the roof of the factory to disguise it. So it was sort of overhead camouflage. So anybody flying over, which nobody ever really did fly over, but if they had, they would have looked down and seen this little sort of half-sized town, which was fake buildings and fake signs and fake streets to disguise this very important wartime factory. Wow, that's fascinating. Something I did not learn in my history class, but you brought up Boeing, and of course, Boeing is huge for us here in Washington, but how did they play that role back then? You said you mentioned the B-17, and then can you also talk about the B-29, I believe it was? Yeah, the B-17 was important in Europe. The B-29, it was a much bigger bomber, it was built down in Renton, the plant where they still build or still try to build the, the 737s. And the B-29, um, it famously helped deliver those atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. You know, the, the, the war is not, of course, it's a, a lot of people died in World War II. A lot of local people lost brothers, sisters, you know, husbands, wives. But the story is so much more nuanced than that because in addition to people going overseas to fight and making sacrifices at home to, to have the kinds of products and things they needed to fight that war. There were also some other bad things that happened, like in 1942, when uh, through executive order, they literally rounded up American citizens, Japanese Americans, Japanese with, of American, Americans of Japanese descent, and put them in concentration camps but over in Idaho and, and California and Wyoming, violated their constitutional rights. Most, many of them lost their property they had. When they came back, they couldn't buy their homes back. It was really a, a, a dark spot in American history. The federal government eventually did formally apologize and award reparations and everything, but it's still this, this really difficult time that's worth remembering to kind of see how we treat people just because they look different from us during World uh -huh. War II. Because we didn't do that to German people in World War II. We only did it to Japanese because they, the Japanese government was the enemy and the Japanese Americans here looked like the enemy. So it was a very complicated time and a dark time in history in addition to being a time of, of great triumph when in 1945, when the war did end 75 years ago, downtown Seattle saw probably the biggest party ever in the history of the city. <laughs> people spontaneously, the afternoon of August 14th, 1945, people spontaneously turned out on the streets. Seattle let loose all the pent up emotions of three years and eight months of war. And to the victors, the spoils. It was just this huge sense of relief. All these four years of sacrifice was over. Of course, nobody knew the Cold War was just ahead and you know, the long, long, debate over communists and over nuclear weapons and all these other things that would happen in the 50s and 60s. But for at least a, several hours there on August 14th, 1945, people celebrated. Then September 2nd, 1945, the formal treaty was signed in Tokyo Bay, hostilities ended. You said something that I kind of want to circle back to how they were treating the um, Japanese Americans at that time with the internment camps um, because they felt threatened. Um, and I know also the propaganda that was put out to make us not want to have them around because they wanted to incite that fear. What do you think we could learn from World War II and what they, the Japanese Americans went through back then? What could we learn and maybe translate that into today's 
you know, uh, race issues. A big takeaway for World War II is you don't violate people's constitutional rights just because we're at war. You never sort of, you never cross the line. I mean, that, it's almost, it's, it's, it's most important to observe the Constitution when it's hardest to do so because all that stuff it was eventually found to be wrong. The government was found to be in error and to be unconstitutionally rounding up American citizens for no other reason other than their ethnic background. And you just can't do that and still call yourself the United States of America. So fortunately, people did pay attention. There's a wonderful history project based in Seattle called Den Show that has been interviewing survivors of the Japanese concentration camps and keeping that history alive. So that lesson can be learned by a new generation and never forgotten because I mean, history is sort of, uh, it's wasted if we don't use it to make ourselves better and keep working on that whole more perfect union business that we all love so much. And Felix mentioned Den Show, a history project based here in Seattle. We're lucky to have it. Den Show's website houses and makes accessible the oral histories and digital archives that chronicle Japanese American incarceration during World War II. The project is designed to share and promote equity and justice. We will link it on our website.